Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It is Wednesday, July 20th. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're having a good week so far and finding creative ways to stay cool. We'll check in with Justin in just a minute. We begin with today's nine at nine. CNN is reporting that the Uvalde School District Police Chief's termination may be decided at a school board meeting on Saturday. They're citing an unnamed source. We are working to confirm this for ourselves. This all comes after a heated meeting Monday night where parents demanded the school board fire him. CNN reached out to Arredondo's attorney but has not received a response. The House of Representatives voted in favor of protecting same-sex marriage rights from any future reversal by the Supreme Court. House Democrats were joined by dozens of Republicans, though the majority of the GOP still voted against the bill. And now heads to the Senate, where it's not clear if it will pass as easily. The U.S. Secret Service has failed to find text messages sought by the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack. That is fueling more questions about whether the texts were inappropriately deleted. The National Archives has given the Secret Service 30 days to investigate the matter and report back. The Secret Service is pledging to cooperate. Steve Bannon's trial moving forward with both sides making opening statements yesterday. Federal prosecutors are making a simple case against Bannon, who they say is guilty of blatantly defying the January 6th Select Committee. Bannon is facing two contempt charges and looking at possible jail time. Prior to his trial starting, Bannon told House investigators he would sit down for an interview. But according to committee members, he has not handed over documents they have requested. U.S. authorities are already on high alert for the midterm elections after the FBI's director warned that foreign countries are looking to interfere with this election cycle. Officials say hybrid threats may include situations where foreign operatives use a cyber incident to spread, quote, panic or lack of confidence, end quote, in our midterms. The director of the NSA says the U.S. is prepared for any interference. The White House says President Biden could announce executive actions on climate change as early as today. An executive action would answer urgent calls from many progressives for Biden to act in the wake of the legislative setback from Senator John Manchin. The White House says declaring a national climate emergency isn't off the table, but probably won't happen this week. Yesterday, the White House released a new executive order relating to U.S. hostages and detainees. The order will allow the administration to impose sanctions and visa bans on those involved in hostage taking and wrongful detention. It also aims to create more transparency between the administration and detainees' families when it comes to sharing intelligence information. Lawyers for billionaire Elon Musk and Twitter slurred off in court for the first time yesterday, and it was a win for Twitter. The judge ordered a five-day trial in October for Twitter's lawsuit against Musk. The social media company sued the Tesla CEO after he backed out of his $44 billion deal to buy the company. The Vaccine Advisory Committee for the CDC voted unanimously yesterday to recommend emergency use of Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine for adults. The FDA had already granted emergency use authorization for the vaccine last week. The CDC director still needs to sign off on the recommendation before shots can be administered. If she does, it would become the fourth coronavirus vaccine available in the U.S. And that's today's 9 at 9. And taking a look outside with live cam, those temperatures are creeping up. And is it kind of hazy, or do we just need to clean our lens there? Oh, no, that, that camera is in awful shape. Uh, <laughs> it needs uh, a good dose of Windex, and yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we've got a few clouds out there. We did see that there on live cam. It's going to help us a little bit this morning. It's it's still going to be a terribly hot day. In fact, we're going to be setting some records this afternoon. Big surprise, right? Uh, 82 degrees at the airport. Dew point is at 73. South southeasterly winds about 13. At least there is a good breeze out there. And the forecast for today takes us up to about 100, 304 for a high temperature, which again would be a record. The old record is 101. That was set back in 2009. Well, let's uh, take a look at the 100 degree days this year. We've been keeping tally every day. 40 days at 100 or above. Now we are just one day away from setting that third place spot set back in 2013. We will most certainly do it with more triple digits in the forecast. Right now, 82 degrees at the airport, 87 is what it feels like, 88. The current heat index in New Braunfels feels like 91 in Gonzales. Prepare for heat indices as high as 106 or 107 this afternoon. 
Uh, we're also going to take another look at the tropics, see where we are in the season. When are things going to start ramping up there? The latest in just a few minutes. But let's go over to traffic now. Are things ramping up in the traffic department? Uh, they sure are, Justin, but you wouldn't be able to tell from these TransGuide cameras. Let's go ahead and get a quick look before we talk about some big problems. 1604 at Spurs Ranch, you can see a lot of these shots are just showing an easy and smooth commute, but unfortunately, can't say the same from what we've been talking about here along I-10. That bridge work that should be wrapping according at 10 a.m. according to TxDOT continues to plague the roadways. We are seeing those eastbound lanes at FM 15 and a little bit further back near 1604 cause some pretty nasty buildup. Right now we're seeing that stretch about seven miles per hour. Earlier we were talking about some suggestions and solutions if you were in the southbound lanes of 1604 and routes you could take. Let's take a look at what you can do if you're traveling in the northbound lanes of Loop 1604. Easy solution. Exit lower Seguin road and take a right there. Uh, it's going to be a pretty easy commute, pretty steady as well. Just continue on Lower Seguin Road and take a right at South Santa Clara Road once you approach that area. What you'll do then, you'll be able to hit I-10 and then, voila, you're going to go ahead and hit Seguin without showing any really signs of slowdown. May take you a little bit longer than a normal route, but it beats sitting in that nasty billet that we continue to see just off of I-10. We'll watch it closely throughout the morning, but while we're at it, let's go ahead and give a big wood look at the metro area there. Just a lot of active construction spots. Thankfully, nothing major is slowing folks down here in the Alamo City, but we are going to keep a close eye along I-10 where that bridge work continues to take place. Hopefully have a better update before the morning wraps up. Guys. Thank you, Stephen. Any morning headlines, an explosion at one of the seven industrial wonders of the world. And the home of Big Bird has some explaining to do. Plus, Harry Styles is the subject of a college class, and one guy is about to find out just how healthy Taco Bell really is. David Sears is here. Okay, healthy. Remember a few years ago, you know, there's a guy that tried to find that out with McDonald's. Yeah, mm -hmm. Super Size Me, I believe, yeah, was the documentary. Like well, this guy's testing it with Taco Bell. More on that in just a second, but first, let's start with this pretty scary scene. When you think about it, that is a fire at the bottom of the Hoover Dam holding back the Colorado River and at Lake Mead right there. A transformer caught fire. The video from one of the visitors, they were from the Bay Area. They said there was an explosion that they heard and then they saw the fire. My immediate reaction was like, that's probably not something that should be happening. There were people actually down in that dam on the tour. The tour guide got them out of there pretty quick. The fire actually out before firefighters got there. Still pretty scary. No word yet on what started the fire. Good news, no effect on the power grid, and no one was injured. A couple of lines from the Sesame Street theme song, come and play, everything is a-okay. Not today, at least not in Sesame Place. That is the kids' amusement park. Nobody amused by what this life-size character appears to do, wave off a couple of black girls while they were reaching out for it. That character, Rosita, after that went viral, a lot of backlash. Mom of one of the little girls, not happy. When he got to my children, he, as you can see in the video, just told them no and kept on moving. And then I had stopped the video because I was upset. But after that, he proceeded to hug another girl of a different race. And to me, it's like, so the kids automatically were like, as you can see in the video, they were, you know, upset. These are innocent children. And the job of the character is to bring joy to the kids and to, you know, acknowledge them. And I'm kind of happy that it went viral because now it brings light to a situation that we shouldn't have anyway. Sesame Place sent out two responses, the first claiming that sometimes the person wearing the costume has a hard time seeing and that the person in that costume did not intentionally ignore the little girls and is devastated about the misunderstanding. The park said they are committed to making this right and will have employees undergo more training. If you go to Texas State or you're headed there this year, look up this class when you get ready to register for classes during the spring semester. It's the Harry Styles class. Yep, dude has his own class, sort of. He's not going to be there, but Louis Dean Valencia, associate professor of digital history, will be there teaching the class. The official title, the Harry Styles and the Cult of Celebrity, Identity, the Internet, and the European Pop Culture. The class is going to cover things like culture and political development of modern celebrity, from gender and sexuality to race to globalism to media to fan culture. Valencia told SYSCA, it's an online newsletter, that the, he wants the class to see how the world has changed over the last 12 years through the eyes of Harry Styles because of his art, creativity, 
and activism. And maybe Harry will show up to class with some Taco Bell. Probably not, but this guy might. Meet Sam Reed. He's planning on eating Taco Bell and a lot of it. There is a method behind his madness. He read an article back in 2016 that said Taco Bell was one of the healthiest fast food restaurants around, and he is about to find out. He's going to eat three meals a day for a month. That's 90 meals. And he is going to have everything on the menu at least once. He will visit several different doctors. That's a good thing during the month to track his health. I'm actually measuring percent body fat, cholesterol, sodium, blood pressure, um, and I'll be doing some fitness tests as well to see if I can kind of maintain my level of physical fitness. My hypothesis is that healthy fast food can actually help you become healthier. For me, that quality content is people actually thinking about what the relationship they have with their food is like. I'm sure a lot of us have a pretty good relationship with our food. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to make this an online documentary so you can follow his progress along the way. Stay tuned. Uh, he's yeah. gonna, they're going to be like, oh, you again. Yeah. When he pulls up to the drive through. I just, I, I, confession, I haven't been to Taco Bell in a while. Yeah. But I looked up their menu. They got a lot of items on the menu. So I don't think you'll have a problem finding different things to eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot Maybe of options. Maybe if he stays away from you know? the soda, he'll be yeah. okay. They even have like a vegan uh, Mexican pizza. How okay. they do that, I don't know, but you know, and, they, and of course, you know, you get your fruits and vegetables. Yeah, be get your vegetables with the burrito. <laughs> fine, it's fine. That's what lettuce is for, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, David <laughs> Sears. 909, about 81 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. A local nonprofit organization giving out $50,000 in scholarships, and they're looking for applicants. We're going to have those details coming up. Plus. Coming up next, Burbank High School students past and present are saying goodbye to the old campus. Details on the sweet send off. 913, it's been a fixture on the south side of San Antonio for 85 years. Now Burbank High School is closing the doors of its old building, but not before a sweet send off. So hundreds of people are expected to attend a final tour of the original campus this weekend where they can take in some of the school's history and share memories. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the home of the Bulldogs with more. Tiffany, what can people expect at this weekend's last look event at Burbank? Good morning. People can expect a lot of excitement, a lot of smiling faces, and probably some tears along the way. Some classes will be decorated, and just check this out. You will find memorabilia, everything from yearbooks, trophies, awards, and just different items the schools have saved here. To talk more about this, we have SAISD trustee Art Valdez and alumni Albert Regalado. Good morning. Albert, we'll Good start morning. with you. Talk to us about what can people also expect this weekend? Well, this Saturday is going to be a, a, basically a walk through memory, down memory lane. Uh, all alumni, there's going to be groups of 500 starting at the gym. We'll be uh, meeting there at the gym. You'll get your schedule there, you'll walk through the foyer and the rest of the classrooms, kind of go down a stroll through memory lane, looking at the different memorabilia and the classrooms that are going to be set up for your uh, look and say, oh, I remember this, I remember that. So it'll be great. And you can also take something maybe in the future, right? Yes, ma'am. We're also going to be doing an auctioning of some of the bricks. Uh, the school district's going to allow that to be done. And those is going to be an auction that's going to be a lot of the proceeds are going to be going back to the school itself and the students themselves. Awesome. And Art, talk to us about what makes this school, this campus so special. Well, you know, Burbank High School has been here for 85 years. The original school uh, that was built here in 1937 was called actually Steve's Garden High School and then officially became uh, Luther Burbank Vocational High School. Uh, many, many generations of, of students have been through here very prominent people throughout, uh, throughout the history of Burbank. Uh, in my own family, I've had three generations of uh, fam families that have come through this school. Uh, of course, I am the first one. My, uh, I have graduated from this school in 1966, class of 1966. My wife graduated here also. Uh, my three kids graduated here and my grandkids graduated uh, from here also. So it's been a very important uh, school to the community. Um, because of uh, a Burbank, when my son, my son Vincent Valdez has been a, a very uh, prominent uh, artist throughout the nation, throughout the world. Uh, he has murals here that, was, that he did in 1996. Uh, if you can scan through, you can see all the murals that he did and all these murals will be uh, now displayed in the new school, the new school that we, has been built and will be open here sometime shortly within the school, coming school year. 
And you wanted to point out, show us where you are in these class pictures over here. Sure. Uh, this is the class of 1966. This is pretty, pretty, pretty good sized class in 1966. I am right here, right there. And I also met my future wife, which is also in this photo right here. So and cool. this is where I met her also. We were married for 50 years. Amazing. So many memories. And you also are in these class pictures. Show us where yes. you are. Actually, I'm right here, right underneath Mr. Valdez. This is the class of 1987. This is where I graduated from. A lot of my kids, all my kids came here to Burbank and graduated from Burbank also. And this is, this is one of the bricks, right? This is one of the bricks that's going to be auctioned off. Uh, and the money is going to go back to the school for future events and things like that for the students. Awesome. I can't wait for this event on Saturday. And just before we go, just check out this cool shirt. What is this? All this about? is actually a rendition of the uh, past and future of Burbank High School. This is what the past is, and this is what the future looking forward from now on. And we also went ahead and, uh, if I can turn around, put the school song, fight song in the back of the school. Fight, 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 bulldogs. Fight, 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 bulldogs, go bulldogs. Once a bulldog, bulldog. always a bulldog. Always a bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> I love that spirit. We're going to have more details about the event on Saturday on the noon show, and we're also going to go to the new campus to learn a little bit about what people can expect this upcoming year. Back to you guys. Awesome. We look forward to it. I love that you were able to show us their pictures when they were in high school. Yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, at least I'll be indoors this yeah. weekend. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. Justin joined us now, keeping an eye on river flows or lack thereof around different parts of our viewing area. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, the Guadalupe, we showed you this a, a couple weeks ago, it actually has gotten a little bit better. There was some rain there that maybe helped out some. The stream flow is not great, but uh, a little bit better than the last time we showed you this. Up there around uh, Kerrville, it's at 9.6 cubic feet per second. Now, it really falls off as you get towards Spring Branch. If you remember, we were live out in that area uh, uh, last week, and it, it, there just wasn't flow there. But as you get past Canyon Lake, it does pick up, albeit still not great, 59 cubic feet per second. Comal is starting to come down, too. So, I mean, the bottom line here is that a little bit of rain would do a lot of good for us. The aquifer is down to 633.4, the 10 day average 633.8. We are well below the July average and still in stage two uh, once a week watering on your day. Rainfall from January 1st to July 19th. We showed this yesterday, but I think it's worth showing again. We've only picked up 5.12 inches. That now is the driest start to a year we have ever seen since records have been kept. And these other years you see here, they were all big drought years. So we know where we're headed here. And uh, unless something changes, uh, that number is going to stand for at least a while longer. There is very little rain in the forecast. Let's go outside for you. Some morning clouds as we look towards downtown. Beautiful shot there. Temperatures 82 degrees at the airport. We'll call it mostly cloudy. Two point is at 73. Feels like 87 at this hour. And the uh, cloud cover. Well, it's been there uh, for the last couple of hours, but I think this probably starts to scatter out. We'll see more sun. Actually, sunny skies, I think, this afternoon. And 79 right now in Boulevardi, 80, Canyon Lake, 82 in New Braunfels. Dew points are in the 70s area-wide, so we have a little more moisture today, just like the uh, last couple of days, and that means the heat index will be anywhere from 105 to 106 during the peak heating hours. Be careful. We say it every day, but we're right back in that range again today. And the forecast high temperatures around the area, everybody in the triple digits, including Kerrville, around 100, 104 San Marcos and Seguin, 102 in Floresville, 105 this afternoon in Pleasanton. Hey, there is some rain on the radar. It's just not here. It's up across parts of North Texas and West Texas this morning. Uh, a few showers for those folks around Amarillo, down the Lubbock and Midland Odessa. I wish we could get in on some of that, but this activity all stays to our north and west and stays away from us. Uh, high pressure still the uh, the main factor here in our forecast moves around a little bit and actually does move far enough east to where I think next week we could get some disturbances coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, at least some moisture that may help to generate uh, some light showers, perhaps middle part of next week. Nothing too much to get excited about yet, but that is a little bit of a pattern change. We're looking at the positives here. 104 today, that would be a record, by the way. 102 on Thursday, 101 Friday, 101 Saturday, 102 Sunday, and more triple digits next week. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back. The Community for Life Foundation is a local philanthropic organization designed to educate, enrich, and empower individuals who want to make a positive contribution to our community. The goal is to help improve the lives of others in our community locally to make an impact globally. Max Massey joins us live to tell us more about the mission. Max, good morning. What is the program looking for when it comes to applicants? Good morning, guys. It really is such an amazing program. Now, they're looking for local students who show resiliency and looking for local students who ultimately want to make our community a better place. Now, the goal is to help today's learners become tomorrow's leaders. They're looking for students who not only want to get through school and make some money, but they're looking for students who want to make a difference. Now, this was all founded in 2001, and since then, they've helped feed over 25,000 people in the annual O oh Give Thanks Holiday Initiative. They sent care packages to some of these scholarship recipients. They've provided one-on-one -on -one tutoring in all subject areas. And of course, they host annual career and college readiness classes. Now, a lot of these scholarship recipients, they become doctors, lawyers, teachers, administrators, executives, entrepreneurs. They've served our country. And the idea of the program is to make a generational impact, not only on these recipients and their families, but on our San Antonio community as a whole. We are giving $50,000 in scholarships to deserving students. So that puts us at $750,000 to more than 350 recipients in greater San Antonio in the past 20 years. We fed over 25,000 people through our Old Give Thanks holiday initiative, sent care packages to scholarship recipients, providing tutoring, uh, hosting career and college readiness classes, so, yeah, that was Dr. Scott. So enthusiastic. I love it. He's actually a former recipient of the scholarship, now a college professor. And he tells me that he's seen students who have been, you know, maybe disengaged from the community. They've gotten reengaged. They've gotten involved. And, you know, they get back to the community. They give back. They help out. And that's what the program wants to do. They want to make sure that the students can not only thrive, but then pe can become local leaders and show progress in our community. So as for the scholarships, there is a watch party. There's a huge scholarship distribution coming up on August 7th for all the scholarship recipients, parents, all the community partners, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. on the Now Word Covenant Church. That's 12525 Nacogdoches. And of course, we're going to have all that information on ksat.com. But guys, I can't stress this enough. It really is such an amazing program. It's helped so many in and around our community. We're far from done. Coming up at noon, we're going to hear from one of the most recent recipients. Her name is Victoria. She is studying to become a trauma nurse. She talks about how much this has meant for her and her family and how she wants to help the community of San Antonio. And I know there's some families out there who may be watching saying, I want to get involved or I want to apply for this scholarship. We're going to explain how to do so. Just head to caseout.com. All right. We look forward to the story. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Max. Good seeing you. At 927, about 82 degrees. We'll be right back. Same-sex marriage supporters are celebrating a win this morning after the House of Representatives voted in favor of protecting those rights from any future reversal by the Supreme Court. House Democrats were joined by dozens of Republicans, though the majority of the GOP still voted against the bill. Many argue that same-sex marriage and other rights are not in jeopardy. As ABC's M. Wynn reports, Democrats are hoping to boost legal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages, but many Republicans are dismissing this idea as a political gimmick. A historic moment on LGBTQ rights. The bill is passed. Nearly 50 House Republicans joined all Democrats to write same sex and interracial marriage into federal law. Democrats believe that the government has no place between you and the person you love. The vote comes amid growing concerns that a conservative Supreme Court could nullify marriage equality. Still, 157 Republicans voted against the Respect for Marriage Act, some calling it a political charade. A bill that is completely unnecessary is reverse the law in 35 states where those states have said marriage should be what, you know, traditional marriage. But Democrats are pointing to Justice Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion in the Supreme Court's decision to strike down Roe versus Wade. Thomas arguing the high court should reconsider its past rulings that gave access to contraception and same-sex marriage. 
and the Democratic caucus is responding swiftly to the sort of anti-freedom, far extreme Supreme Court. Many Republicans argue same-sex marriage and other rights are not in jeopardy, even though earlier this week, Senator Ted Cruz said this about the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, in Obergefell, the court said, no, we know better than you guys do, and now every state must uh, m must sanction and, and permit gay marriage. Um, I think that decision was clearly wrong when it was decided. Um, it was the court overreaching. While the bill sailed through the House, it's unclear if it has the votes to pass in the evenly split Senate. The House is also expected to vote on a bill this week that would protect a person's ability to access and use contraceptives, which aim to prevent pregnancy. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. And here at home, other top stories, a man is accused of running over and murdering his wife, but his lawyer says it was a freak accident. Today is day three of the trial of David Estrada. Yesterday, one of the last people to see Estrada's wife alive took the stand. Raul Gamboa says Estrada and his wife, Dominga Pescada, were hanging out at his home in September of last year. Gamboa says nothing appeared to be wrong between the couple, but minutes after they left his home, Gamboa says he heard his dogs barking, so he looked outside and saw Estrada. I was asking him questions, he couldn't respond, like he was just, like in the day, like in the days. So I asked him, where's Minga, where's Minga? And then he takes off running. Surveillance video shows Domingo walking down the street. Prosecutors say Estrada's truck is seen following closely behind her. Moments later, after a brief conversation, prosecutors say the truck accelerates toward Domingo, killing her. And we are continuing to follow this trial, and we'll have a recap of today's testimony in our later newscast. Well, a couple of incidents on the Riverwalk in recent days. The video, you probably have already seen that brawl at a local restaurant between a customer and an employee Friday. And then yesterday, a double stabbing at the shops at River Center Mall. San Antonio police are investigating both incidents and asked for the Riverwalk fight. Police say a customer was unhappy with service and the bill, then got physical with employees. One person can even be seen using a waiter's tray as a weapon. The incident in the River Center Mall was, I mean, that's not something that happens. That's very uncommon. The fight on the Riverwalk, um, I, you know, I, I shake my head at somebody who would start a brawl because he wasn't happy with the meal. Try to stay, I'm trying to stay out of big crowds, knowing that stuff like that happens, uh, especially since this morning. That's Come it. on down Very to good. San Antonio. <laughs> keep the faith, keep the peace, keep the love. <laughs> the stabbing of the fight come just weeks after a body was found along the river walk. When asked about the police presence in that area, P Police Chief William McManus says he believes there is enough law enforcement there. After 95 years, St. Gerard Catholic School is closing its doors because of low student enrollment. The Archdiocese of San Antonio says just 35 students enrolled for the upcoming school year, which would have put the projected operations deficit at $500,000. A big part of that budget comes from tuition, along with donations, fundraising, and Archdiocese subsidies. The Archdiocese had already been subsidizing St. Gerard for the last several years, and with just 35 students, the expense is not sustainable. Department of Catholic Schools and the Archdiocese of San Antonio are helping currently enrolled students transition to other Catholic high schools in the city. Outside with live cam, already 83 degrees out there, and Justin was nice enough to share a picture of his windshield sunshade. Uh. <laughs> That's not mine. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I have longhorns on my shade, but hey, you know. Uh, this is a great picture. Uh, Skywatcher sent this in. Uh, I haven't seen a shade like <laughs> this one. Okay, it does kind of make me laugh. Funny. Very Texas. S says these folks would not steer you wrong. I I said, um, yes. <laughs> Love the pictures. Hey, you know, this reminds me, and Stephanie brought this up earlier. If you have a cool, uh, a cool way to stay cool, or an interesting way to stay cool, share it with us on KSAC Connect. We'd love to see it. You know, we get into these doldrums. We'd love to see some pictures of of how you stay cool during this summer heat. You can send it in on that uh, on the KSAT weather app. There's a link at the bottom called pins and you can uh, submit your picture that way. High temperatures yesterday, 109 in Dallas. It was 110 in Oklahoma City, 111 in Phoenix, 109 in Las Vegas. That ridge of high pressure just baking basically the southwestern and central part of the country. And that includes us. 82 degrees in the airport right now, 87. The, uh, the heat index, 88 is what it feels like in New Braunfels, 89, the current heat index down there at Stinson.
KSAT 12 hour forecast will lose these morning clouds 93 by noontime. We're up around 104 by 5 o'clock. That would be a record high for the date. We'll talk more about uh, how July is ranking temperature wise, plus a look at the tropics too. Coming up, guys. Jesse, I think you're right. More likely, Steph's windshield sunshade, yes. which is a mouthful when you think about it, <laughs> yes. right? Okay, though gas prices have recently dipped, AAA reports prices are still 43% higher than they were the same time last year. So people are continuing to come with different means of transportation. A longtime cycle shop owner here in San Antonio tells our Courtney Friedman a big change they've been seeing lately is a spike in motorcycle and scooter sales. It's an option many drivers never thought they'd consider, buying a motorcycle. Any motorcycle is going to have better fuel economy than, than a car. So it's a lot less weight, smaller engine size. So you're looking at 30, 40, 50 miles to the gallon. Dave Sears owns Alamo Cycleplex and says people who just can't afford these sky-high fuel prices are steering in a different direction. And it's not just motorcycles. They just want something to commute to work, much, much like this. This is a scooter, you know, just, just like we're all used to. And you just you jump on and it maybe does 35 miles an hour and you just, you, you know, you go to work. Though the scooters have been extremely popular, some customers are opting for even smaller options. Not only are people buying, you know, smaller size motorcycles, electric bicycles, but we, we have a product we call the One Wheel, which is sort of a motorized skateboard. There's one big wheel in the middle. They're a lot of fun. Sears says the economy is hitting dealers too by way of supply chain issues and delivery gas price hikes. So you can expect to see a couple extra fees tacked onto your purchase. Now we're paying extra shipping charges to get the bikes here and then of course unfortunately that gets passed on to the consumer and in, in the way of a fee but he says without question you'll be saving more on gas in the long run courtney friedman case at 12 news and now to something that doesn't sound too pretty but it's the latest beauty trend it is called slugging and it's taking the internet by storm some dermatologists say it actually may be good for you but as 12 on your sides marilyn moritz reports with the good comes the bad among skincare fads it's slimy and trendy, a beauty routine called slugging, huge on TikTok. But petroleum jelly for skincare actually has been around for more than a century. Now social media slugging believers all but guarantee if you apply the goo to your face at bedtime, you'll wake up to glass skin. Slugging will make your skin look as clear as glass is debatable, but for a lot of people, it can be super beneficial. Mostly for people with dry, aging, or damaged skin. Why? Petroleum jelly found in products like Vaseline and Aquaphor helps lock in moisture by acting as a protective barrier. But if you use products to fight acne or anti-aging creams, skincare experts say, be careful. If ingredients like retinol or alpha hydroxy acids are applied underneath, slugging can lead to irritation and breakouts. The craze doesn't stop there. Hair slugging is said to help hair growth. A consumer report says putting petroleum jelly on your scalp won't help your hair grow and could make dandruff worse. Putting it on the ends, though, can keep hair hydrated. One trend getting a definite thumbs down, skin lightening creams. They're marketed to darker skinned people, but they may contain harmful chemicals like mercury. A lot of these chemicals have been linked to hormonal changes and even cancer. So be sure to read the labels and stay away. Beauty regimens that are always in, washing off dirt and makeup before bed, and using sunscreen. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. 940, about 83 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. And coming up after the break, Alicia Barrera talks about the impact the drought is having on the agriculture industry. She spoke with cattle farmers about the challenges they're facing and how long they predict it will take to rebound. 944, we'll talk to Justin in a moment. The impacts of the drought are significant and negative. It's putting a strain on the cattle industry, leading ranchers to rush and sell their livestock. It's an eerily similar situation from a decade ago when the 2011 drought led to historically low cattle numbers. Alicia Barrera visited the Seguin Cattle Company where ranchers hope one day they'll recover, but for now, they have to cash in. The relentless heat has cooked up brown pastures, cracked open the soil, and once again has threatened the Lone Star State's beef cattle production. It's been good, it's been bad, and I've seen a lot of changes in my life. Hilmer Cowie got his start in the beef cattle industry about 60 years ago. When you're in agriculture, you're always concerned. 
concern that has taught him tough lessons and to always be prepared for bad times. We would have grazing. Usually that's what happens this time of the year. But with the drought going on right now, we're feeding range cubes and we're also feeding uh, hay to the cows. However, hay has also become scarce, making it harder and more expensive to feed their herd. With not enough food, the drought is forcing sellers to cash in earlier at places like Seguin Cattle Company. But even then, the number of cattle up for auction has definitely decreased over the years. 42, 40, 42. According to the USDA's annual cattle inventory report, the beef cow herd declined by 2% down to 30.1 million. And Brian Lensman, manager at Seguin Cattle Company, says it won't be long before this year's drought catches up at the meat counter. We're taking young cows in the prime of their life and they're getting turned into hamburger meat. We're selling them just out of desperation because you don't want to mistreat the animal and make it starve, so we're dispersing herds. From experience, ranchers know it'll take years to recover. I mean, that's up to Mother Nature and God. Just pray for rain. Alicia Barrera, KSAT, 12 News. Oh, it seems like we've been talking now for months and months about how we feel for farmers and ranchers around yes. here. I know. I hope, we get, I hope we get some rain. I know not anytime soon, though, Justin. And this time of year, uh, we tend to try to rely on some sort of tropical moisture, just not a full-fledged hurricane. Correct. It's, it's kind of a risky balance there, but yes. we hope to get some moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, maybe a weak tropical storm or tropical depression that has helped us in the past. Unfortunately, this year we haven't seen any of that either. It has been a really slow start to the hurricane season, but I will point out that we are still very early in the season. Uh, you look at the graph here and this shows the uh, number of named storms and when we tend to peak and that is around September 10th. That's when we uh, normally see the most number of storms historically. And so we're we're about right here. We are going to start to see things ramp up or you would think that we would start to see things ramp up so far. There is uh, just not much out there. No development expected over the next five days, according to the Hurricane Center. Can't even find a wave out there. Everything has been pretty far south. So hopefully we'll get some waves coming off of Africa here in the hopefully over the next month or so and those will work their way towards us again we don't want the hurricane but we could certainly use some of that moisture because things have been so terribly dry and as we look at the uh, heat advisories today plenty of them heat advisories excessive heat warnings excessive heat warnings are in pink here and this stretches from san antonio up to dallas wichita falls little rock memphis it is a large area a ton of people will be dealing with some uh, very, uh, very high heat indices this afternoon. This is the forecast high temperature, 108 in Dallas, which is down a little bit from yesterday's high. 107, the forecast high in Wichita Falls. Even Houston around 100, they're going to have a lot of humidity there, so their heat index will be uh, up there this afternoon. Uh, 104 here in San Antonio, and our heat index will be somewhere around 106, 107. So we're still very much in the danger category as well. And as we look at the month of July, we are now averaging 89.9 degrees. Uh, and that is uh, good enough to rank us at the top of the list. Now, that's as of now. Things could change, of course, although uh, here over the next week, it should uh, stay right there. And we are leading that list uh, in 2009. Second place, 88.7 degrees back then. As we go outside for you, we look at the time lapse. We had mostly clear skies last night, but some clouds shifted in this morning. They're already starting to move out. This was uh, this was brief. 82 degrees at the airport. South southeast really winds at 13. So some good breezes today, but it's still uh, still going to be very, very hot. And you see the cloud cover. There's not much there anymore. 89, uh, 79 at Burning Stage, 82 Comfort, 81 Canyon Lake, 85 Stinson, and you're at 86 down there in Pleasanton. The two point trend today. Dew points do come down into the uh, low 60s, but that is still enough to create that heat index, as we said, anywhere from 104 to 108 around the area. And the forecast temperatures locally, 104 in Seguin, 102 Floresville, 105 Pleasanton, 107 down there in Carrizo Springs. So our case at 12 hour forecast, 93 degrees noontime. This is that uh, time of day where it's just uh, not so fun to be outside. 103, 4 o'clock, 104 at 5 p.m and down to 98 by uh, 8 p.m. Uh, extended forecast, more of the same uh, triple digits all the way through. Still, still not seeing any rain chances. Maybe middle part of next week we can get a couple of light showers. But nothing significant, guys. All right, uh, fingers understood. crossed. Yeah. Yep.
Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. 9, 50, 83 degrees. And when we come back, the story of a mother-daughter duo who has taken over TikTok with their food critiques. And welcome back. It's 9.53. So a mother-daughter team is turning their love for food into a real bread and butter enterprise. ABC's Will Gann spoke with the duo about how all this got started and how it's taking over TikTok. Oh my God. Oh. They're the unlikely food critics who have gotten a taste of TikTok fame and some other stuff. Cheers. Okay, we're buying we're going back. Meg Antonelli, a.k.a. Costco Mama, and her daughter Maddie started posting their food reviews back in 2020. It's an A-plus. I would definitely I recommend. recommend this. We were in Costco one day, and I'm like, let's review this hummus. I'm like, why not? Might as well try it out. So, and I thought she was crazy. Yeah, I was and like, <laughs> review, what I was mean? like, we're reviewing it on your TikTok account because she had gotten like 200 uh, views at one point, and I, we thought that was so many. Now, more than 21 million likes and 618,000 followers later, I mean, we're we're honest with our reviews. If we don't like something, you know, we don't like it. Have you ever like tried something that you look back on and you're like, never again? Yes. The octopus. <laughs> you know, I was just <laughs> saying that the octopus. <laughs> never again. <laughs> Might as well eat a can of cat food. I'm sorry. Maddie just graduated college in May. We, we have fun. fun. Yeah, we have so much fun doing it together. Now that she's back home, Maddie and mom are able to up their review game. Where do the ideas come from? Going to Costco. Costco. <laughs> Going to Costco five times a week. Despite being Costco super fans, the Antonelli say they are not sponsored by the store. I think it's really that like mother daughter like duo that people like to see because yeah. i mean i've had people come up to me being like i don't have my mom in my life and like watching you guys it make it's like makes me feel so much better meg and maddie just happy to serve up some smiles sometimes at their own expense it has like almost like it's got extra bubbles or something that it's like it's like an <laughs> it's like in my throat Maddie starts her real job next week, so while the reviews may not come in quite so frequently, there are no plans to stop making them. Mom says their food reviews will always be a two-woman job. Will Gans, ABC News, New York. Next, we need Stefan Rooney doing a similar thing. Oh All right, tomorrow goodness. on TMSA9, we're going backstage at the newest musical performance at the Public Theater of San Antonio. We're going to hear from some of the cast and the director of the musical. They'll tell us about the power of love and what we as a community can take away from the show. That story tomorrow on GMSA at 9. All right, how hot today? 104. <laughs> Blowing out the old record of 101. Okay, we're right. out of time for weather. And that may be a good thing today, right? Yes. Have a great day, guys.